Alaskans have dreamed and schemed some big tourism and economic ideas for the 49th state through the decades. Everything from a giant styrofoam igloo lodge. It's too bad it didn't work out because I think it would have been a really cool place and uh, unique. To a city under a dome and a freshwater pipeline to California. Who were the dreamers and what happened to their grand ideas? We're looking at Alaska boondoggles tonight on Alaska Insight. A giant artificial igloo marks the halfway point between Fairbanks and Anchorage along the park's highway. It was supposed to be a roadside hotel, but it never opened for business. Our field producer, Emily Schwing, has more. It's a dream that just didn't pan out. Built in the 1970s, the four-story igloo now serves as an odd landmark for curious passers-by and vandals. Longtime Anchorage-based artist Duke Russell added the igloo's image to a collection of postcards he created in 2013. You know, we, we have a succession of, of, of kind of failed attempts to sort of infuse the economy with things. Sometimes I think hubris gets in the way. The igloo is a far cry from being the only so-called boondoggle in the state. Russell says Alaskans are surrounded by ambitious and unfortunately failed projects. He cites a state-funded $50 million fish processing plant in Anchorage that sold for half the price to a megachurch. That is maybe an example where some simple logistics uh, could have b uh, come into play before the thing was built. And then there's the airport train depot that Alaskans never even use. There's no reason why you and me and everybody else couldn't take a train to the airport when we need to come and go. Although these efforts might seem like expensive failures, Russell praises the creativity behind them. He says he's mesmerized by the mathematics required to construct a four-story igloo in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's too bad it didn't work out because I think it would have been a really cool place and uh, unique. And, it, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't give me any pleasure at all to see it all kind of beat up and tagged and everything else, you know. Because that was somebody's, like, they probably poured every single thing they had into that thing. During the winter, highway maintenance crews with the State Department of Transportation keep a pullout cleared of snow so that anyone driving by can stop to take photos of the igloo. According to the Department of Environmental Conservation, current owners are working to clean up contaminated soil around the igloo site, and they're monitoring groundwater in the area for contamination. For Duke Russell, places like the igloo aren't only fodder for his artwork. They also serve as a warning. I love the imagination. I love people's visions. And I really encourage people to, to draw it out, do it on paper, get, get some sense of, of where you're going with it, and uh, encourage uh, that creative thinking, because that's really more of the, the story. For Alaska Public Media, I'm Emily Schwing. Joining me for a discussion on some of the big and often colorful ideas through the years are visiting UAA professor and former state lawmaker Willie Hensley. Also on hand today is Tim Bradner, publisher of the Alaska Legislative Digest and former UAA Atwood Chair for Journalism. Thanks both of you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Willie, I want to start with you. There's certainly been some wild ideas pitched for Alaska, uh, as we were discussing the late Governor Wally Hickel's ideas for a freshwater pipeline and an undersea train to Russia are something we'll, we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But it seems to me that one of the biggest boondoggles that was proposed for Alaska was the notion in 1958 of building a deep water port in the Arctic pretty much instantly by detonating six nuclear weapons known as Project Chariot and memorialized in Dan O'Neill's book, The Firecracker Boys. It really sounds like science fiction, but it was not. The idea was stopped by residents of Point Hope and others. Tell us about what you remember about this. You worked on this project, isn't that right? Yes, I, I hate to admit it, but 
<laughs> I was a, a young college student in Fairbanks back uh, way back then uh, in the early 60s. And back then, you know, there wasn't much work around and you, you took anything that came by. And so uh, I had absolutely no idea what this project was, but uh, by God, it was going to pay me like two eighty nine an hour or something. <laughs> it was going to be near Kotzebue. So uh, so I, I was flown up there uh, by Ray Ferguson, actually, and uh, in a Pilatus Porter. And we landed sort of across the runway because it had these huge wings big wind. Anyway, as it turns out, it was, uh, in, in retrospect, a relatively poorly funded project. I mean, all the buildings were made out of canvas, uh, uh, Quonset huts. And uh, I was actually employed as a uh, on the drilling crew. And this, uh, this drill, I thought it was the most gigantic drill I'd ever seen. But in retrospect, it was nothing more than a water well drilling uh, outfit on wheels. And it really didn't have the power to do the job it's supposed to do that uh, that uh, uh, that summer. And uh, thank goodness, you know, I, I, of course, now I know uh, well, how catastrophic that project uh, uh, would have been. And unfortunately, it had the support of all of the political figures in Alaska, including the president of the University of Alaska. Was you know? it? And, and it was... Uh, I think it would have had a lasting negative effect in, in that part of the world. Did people really understand what was being proposed at the time, or was was it no. was it not fully discussed <clears throat> as to what w the intention they was? Never, they were just doing some testing, and you were hired to do certain drill testing. They, the I think the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, they had come up with this idea of peaceful uses of atomic energy. And they were going to try to reshape their Earth, you know, using uh, all, all these uh, scientists. <clears throat> and I, I don't think they had even gone to village to the village of Point Hope or even Kivalina for the first couple of years that they were up there working. And mm -hmm. of course, needless to say, the, the villagers got very, very concerned uh, because uh, the Atomic Energy Commission wasn't really telling the truth about about the potential negative effects, you know, of of radiation. Radiation, right? And so, thank goodness, uh, you know, they started asking the questions that eventually led to its uh, demise. Mm -hmm. Thank you for getting us started there. Uh, Tim, what are your thoughts about this scheme? What, uh, what do you know about that era and, and, uh, and the fact that it was stopped by you know, a movement of, of a small community, a uh, very remote community and their allies and supporters is pretty extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Of course, the idea is sort of outlandish when you think about it these days, exploding nuclear bombs to blast a big hole in the ground and uh, not not to worry about the radiation effects. Pretty pretty amazing that p people actually thought they could get away with that. But I think the um, I think the fact that it mobilized. Uh, what's interesting about Project Charity is it was one of the first times that it actually mobilized indigenous people to to uh, focus on something that was going to adversely affect their their way of life, and it really demonstrated to people what they could do when they got organized and, and it got unified and uh, taken action. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the legacy of Project Chariot uh, played out years later when the land claims movement started. People realized what they could achieve by working together. Oh, interesting. So I think it was pretty fundamental. Yeah, that's a, that's a great perspective on it. This plan, this particular plan, Willie, I want to turn back to you for a moment now. This plan for blowing up nuclear bombs didn't come to fruition. But nukes were blown up underground in the late 60s and 70s on Amchitka Island as bomb tests. The waste from that is still in those test wells on the island in one of the most seismically active places in the world. Right. Was there ever conversation in the legislature that you're aware of, either when you were a lawmaker or that you've heard of through the years, uh, about pushing the Department of Defense to remove that as it is considered a formerly used defense site and um, pushing to have that cleaned up? You, you know, uh, the, sa the sad truth is that um, historically, um, Alaskans, pioneers primarily, <laughs> you know, were just desperate for any kind of uh, spending in Alaska. You know, and, and we're in, sa in, in fact so desperate that they literally were inviting the federal government to use Alaska as a testing ground, and that—that's how uh, how uh, uh, they thought that the economy, you know, uh, would get boosted. And uh, yes, I, I think the the federal government, uh, you know, I think they they have spent a lot of money cleaning up messes that they've made from the dew line system, 
uh, from the explorations up there in Petroleum Reserve Number Four, where they left literally thousands of barrels of, of uh, partially used fuel up there. So, I mean, the government has been uh, uh, attempting to clean up the messes that it's made, but uh, some of these, like th that nuclear uh, uh, project, you know, how how do you do anything about something like that? It's it's already done, you know. Mm. Yeah, um, it's in those wells and encased in concrete from what I understand after having read some of the documents. So it's probably going to stay there. Tim, let's uh, talk about some of former governor, the late Wally Hickel's ideas for Alaska's economic future. He liked to dream big and he pitched the idea of building a pipeline to send fresh water to California. This was, of course, decades before people normalized the idea of buying water in bottles because I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, if you would have said, let's sell water in bottles, people would have laughed you out of the room. But now we know that's a, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. It probably sounded laughable at the time, but considering the growing freshwater concerns in some lower, lower 48 states, especially California, Hickel had a vision for future problems. What do you know about this idea and whether anybody took it seriously at that time? Well, no, nobody took, at the time really took it seriously, but people, people um, this is typical Wally Hickel. I mean, people appreciated him and I've, and over the years I've come to appreciate him more as a big vision thinker. He, he would run things out like that. They seemed outlandish. Uh, they you know, obviously um, needed a lot of work to see if they were even feasible, and a lot of them, most of them weren't feasible, but he got people thinking about it. And I think, Laurie, you're right. The idea that that two two ideas that came out of that, one is the, that we could export water, that there was a market for Alaska clean water. So now we have water being bottled here in, um, in, uh, in the Anchorage, South Central Alaska and shipped out of state and sold locally. And we have water in Southeast Alaska that's been watered. That's kind of a, a legacy of, of Hickel's ideas. Um, and who knows, the, uh, the, the idea of a water pipeline uh, brought home to a lot of people the notion that the Pacific, that, that the West Coast was going to be water short and people should be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But Hickel was like that. You know, he had a lot of other ideas that uh, got people thinking about things. Mm -hmm. It seems like it would only be viable in the summertime unless you laid an undersea kind of a pipeline or something. That would be the, the main thing is how would you keep it from freezing? Oh, the idea is it would be a, a, a subsea pipeline. It would be laid on the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, who knows, maybe something like that someday may be feasible, but yeah. it wasn't then. But it yeah. got people thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, such an interesting idea. Uh, let's discuss another long ago project that developers had high hopes for, but it just didn't work out. In 1952, an apartment building called the Polaris opened in downtown Fairbanks. The hope was that a vibrant community would grow up around it. And for a time, it was a popular spot, but it didn't last. And for two decades now, it stood abandoned and slowly decaying. Our field producer, Emily Schwing, has more on this story. The Polaris was supposed to draw up-and-coming young professionals looking for a hip place to live in downtown Fairbanks. But in the 1990s, fewer people were living downtown, so it was renovated to become a hotel. That closed 20 years ago, and now the building simply sits empty in the center of the Golden Heart City. I think that it's concerning that our, our tallest building in Fairbanks is abandoned. Uh, I think of every other city that I know of, and I don't know of any city that can claim to that. J. Jason Lazarus is a professor of photography at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Back in 2009, he and a student managed to convince a real estate company to hand over the keys so they could venture inside the Polaris with cameras in hand. Once you got up to the, to the second floor, uh, the beds were actually still made. There was once a steakhouse on the ground floor and a popular cocktail lounge on the roof. The Tiki Cove on the top floor was the hot spot, uh, the night, uh, nighttime hot spot at that, at that time. A decade ago, the city was in constant conversation with a developer who planned to renovate and revitalize the building. But as the years dragged on, issues around financing the project grew murky and the plans stalled. 
A 700-page brownfield study released by the EPA in 2017 lists all the contaminants inside the derelict building, everything ranging from asbestos to black mold. The city of Fairbanks has submitted an application to the Department of Defense for military assistance to demolish the Polaris. If approved, Fairbanks' tallest building could be demolished sometime in the next year. For Alaska Public Media, I'm Emily Schwing. So uh, military assistance to bring it down, those photographs are just so amazing. They're really compelling and tell such a story. Tim, what do you know about this? Why didn't this work out? I, I don't really know. I mean, there was a succession of, develop, of private owners and they had different ideas. Um, and I want to point out also that there's another building in Fairbanks that was built a little earlier. It's not as tall as the Polaris building, but it's called the Northward Building, which has always been an apartment condo type building is, and had retail on the ground floor. And that was successful. I mean, it's still there. It's still occupied. Hmm. And why why that was done and why the, the Polaris building didn't work out, I, I, I don't know. Hmm. But the city would definitely like to demolish it. And it's going to cost a, you know, a fair chunk of change, you know, more than a couple million dollars to bring it down. Yeah. Um, but Fairbanks, it, it's unfortunate because downtown Fairbanks needs, I mean, that's kind of like a, those those kind of buildings and the businesses and people that occupy them are sort of anchors for downtown. So it's a, um, uh, it, it, it's kind of a warning to people about uh, letting your downtown decay and, and the things that keep people downtown too much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Willie, did you, uh, what are your thoughts about this or, or why it didn't work out? Did you ever visit the Polaris during its heyday? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> didn't the uh, Petroleum Club used to be up there, Tim? Yes, it did. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Back in the days when the pipeline was going great guns and we were doing a lot of contracting on the North Slope. Yes, you kind of tried to hang out where the oily guys were. So I, was um, to, I stayed in the Players Club or mm. in the Players Building when it was a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, actually, isn't it a prototype though? Of, of, wasn't isn't isn't it the same building that's down here on like Fourth Avenue, uh, where the state used to have offices way back in the '60s, and it's still now an office. I mean a uh, apartment building somebody renovated it and then the, is, isn't it the mendenhall apartments also the, the sort of like the same structure in juno i i don't know they they, they look similar the mckay i think you're speaking of the mckay building in anchorage yeah yeah the mckay used to be the mm. mckay building yeah and it was just sat there derelict for years until yeah, the same yeah. developer moved down and, and renovated the building it is now leasing it out for office space but he, he could make, it was the same developer who, who tried to do the deal for the Polaris building, and he, he couldn't make it work in Fairbanks. All right. But he did make it work for the McKay building in, in Anchorage. Right. So but those, those buildings really date, they all date from the same period. And you're right, Willie, they all have sort of the same design. Yep. That kind of reminds me, uh, brings to mind, Willie, uh, another grand plan that actually did work out. The hotel Captain Hook, which uh, Wally Hickel proposed after the 1964 earthquake to encourage more development in downtown Anchorage. And some people at that time thought uh, a luxury high-rise hotel would be a boondoggle, but almost 50 years later, it's still there. What did people think? Why, why at the time do you, do you know it, what the thinking was and why people thought, oh, this is a bad idea? Was it just that they were overwhelmed by the damage and couldn't imagine that for this small city or? Well, you know, w Wally was a, you know, he was an active guy. I mean, he uh, had ideas. I mean, he did the Traveler's Inn here and they did one in Fairbanks. And, you know, he was always an optimistic sort. And, uh, and I think it, it shocked people when uh, just after the earthquake, he decided to build this sort of a, for that day, a, a mega structure really mm -hmm. with steel. You know, and, and the, the design was uh, pretty avant-garde for its day, and uh, and uh, you know he was sort of ahead of his time in a sense. Uh, you know, Anchorage, Alaska was growing, Anchorage was growing, and uh, it was a successful investment. Which uh, in those days, a steel uh, a steel structure, you know, was a pretty expensive thing to build. Mm -hmm. So he did well with it. You know, or uh, if I can add, yes, please, Tim, jump in there. If I could add something to this, I think what's important to point out is that that was an example, and I, I'll, I'll cite another one other example to kind of go along with that, of a uh, decision by by a businessman at a time when the city was very depressed after the earthquake, 
uh, a visionary statement that there was a future for Anchorage. And I think it gave a lot of people a lot of hope. Uh, this, the same thing happened with the Cuddy family uh, in the construction of the, what is what was the first National Bank building down to a multi-story office building right after the earthquake. Um, kind of a real statement of faith that the that the uh, Cuddy family had with the bank and, and the future of Anchorage. Gave mm -hmm. a lot of people confidence that maybe they can rebuild. Mm -hmm. So these things work out sometimes. Well, and I, I'm interested to get back to, I hope we have enough time to get back to the undersea railroad idea. But Willie, I wanted to ask you about the Rampart Dam because um, in an earlier interview when you were talking about that, I was astounded by this story. This would have created the largest reservoir in the world. Tell us about this plan for this uh, remote area 100 miles west of Fairbanks for this mega project. Oh, it was one grand scheme <laughs> in in retrospect. Uh, it was proposed by the Corps of Engineers in uh, 1954. It's about 31 miles from Rampart, a, a village there on the Yukon. It would have created a lake the size of Lake Erie, the, in a, the largest man-made reservoir in the world. Uh, it would have inundated nine villages. And mm. of course, back then, that was an afterthought, sad to say. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, former governor, territorial governor, uh, Ernest Greening was a, a, a great supporter of, uh, of the Rampart Dam Damage. It's one of those ideas that uh, unfortunately we have in Alaska where if you build it, they will come. You know, it, they, it, they would have pr produced uh, just, uh, I think like three and a half to five uh, gigawatts. There weren't any users really identified specifically for, for that power, but they were hoping there would be mines developed and uh, you know, timber processing and that, that sort of thing create lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually a project that both candidates for president supported back in 60. Uh, Nixon and Kennedy both, you know, supported that notion. And then it just went uh, away, uh, this enormous project that was proposed yeah. and touted even nationally, and, and it just went away. <laughs> it, it would have raised the Yukon River about 400 feet. Unbelievable. Can you that? Wow. It's, you know, it's incredible, Amazing. some of these ideas that come along. Uh, before we run out of time, Tim, uh, getting back to Hickel's big ideas, he also pitched building an undersea railroad to Russia for connecting Alaska to Europe, for commerce and tourism. Was there ever any serious talk about this, or was it more just another big idea touted by a man who really thought in terms of big future visions? I don't think there was really ever a lot of work done on it. Uh, Wally, this is another one of Wally's big visions that I think he just threw out there to get people thinking about it. But other, others picked up on it, and there have been other um, other people talk talk about it. Uh, Will, Willie remembers, did, did Willie, you remember somebody who had an idea of putting a dam across the Bering Strait? Actually, uh, two things. I remember I was in the legislature when he first became governor. Uh, he proposed something called the North Commission, Northern Operation of Rail Transportation and Highways. And Morris Thompson, Athabascan, and later president of Doyan, he was the executive director. And so, so Wally, you know, he, he was some, for some reason, maybe he, because he grew up in Kansas, he was impressed with railroads, you know. And, and in fact, I, I know that he had ridden the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad and so from from the get-go he wanted to build a railroad to know you know and so but of course you got to have something to haul and we never had anything to haul <laughs> mm. so that's probably the primary reason why it didn't get off the ground is there just wasn't enough commerce to make it actually pay to you're not going to move enough right, people yeah. back and forth from Nome to make that viable right. and, and Lori if I could make a uh, just make a point that what undoes a lot most of these projects in the end is simply the lack of economics uh, Rampart Dam fell apart because nobody could figure out what to do with the um, the power. It was hopelessly un uneconomic. Yeah. And uh, so it, it gives you, I guess, some faith that these things, they, 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 they have a certain life and then they, they peter out when serious people start looking at the numbers and realize they aren't feasible. Do you think Alaska is more susceptible to big schemes and dreams than other places or does every state have their, their wild visionaries? Oh, I, I think we're big thinkers here. We, we, you know, we live in Alaska. We do things big. Uh, I remember when I, when I first came to uh, Fairbanks in the 1960s, um, 
the big excitement in town and the headlines in the news minor were the big copper discoveries at Bornite of the Northwest Northwest Arctic. Mm. And you know, we talked about building railroads and big mines up there, and that was going to save our economy. Well, the copper is still there. As a matter of fact, there is a mine being proposed now yeah. uh, up there. But, um, Big but dreams, it's, um, and, yeah, big schemes. I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. We'll have to revisit these ideas because there's so much to discuss and uh, we didn't get to all of the, the big schemes from the past and we'll have to do this again. Thank you so much, Willie and Tim, for being with me this evening. Well, Alaska thank you for is, inviting us. Alaska is known for big dreams and big schemes and this evening we heard about just a few of them that have been attempted or at least discussed over the last 50 years. What will be the grand ideas for the next 50 years? That remains to be seen, but there's sure to be more as Alaskans seek to create a strong future for our economy, culture and lifestyle. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. Be sure to tune in daily to your local public radio station for Alaska Morning News and Alaska News Nightly every weeknight. Be part of conversations happening on Talk of Alaska every Tuesday morning and visit our website, alaskapublic.org, for breaking news and reports from across the state. We'll be back next Friday. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.